Hi, I'm Time staff writer Reza Bruner, and I'm joined today by Mark Ruffalo, award-winning actor and co-founder of The Solutions Project, and Gloria Walton, the organization's incoming CEO and president. Welcome to Time 100 Talks. Thanks. Thank you. Mark, let's start at the beginning. Since 2013, The Solutions Project, which you co-founded, has distributed over $5 million in grants to over 100 people who are solving things, all working on climate and sustainability and equity issues. The goal is clean energy for all. You have a lot of demands on your time. You have a lot of different causes you could be a part of. Why this one? Well, um, kind of the way uh, solutions uh, came to be and, and what it's moved out to be, it was, um, it came out of out of frontline communities. I was living in a frontline community here in, in upstate New York. Um, they were gonna make, you know, build out a huge fracking infrastructure here. And we were fighting it. And, um, and it occurred to us, well, if we're not gonna use fracking, then we have to come up with another form of energy. And, um, and we, we basically went and found the science that showed us how we can move um, to 100% renewable energy. We adopted that and we started to push it. Uh, this was a while ago before anyone uh, was really talking seriously about transitioning to 100% renewable energy. Um, but we were seeing how uh, effective that message was and how effective it, it was happening in, in small communities here. And um, and we decided that we should take, we should make this uh, bigger and go globally. And um, and along the way, uh, we started talking about equity. Um, we were t we at first we were talking business, science, and culture together. But what we were missing from that was community. And um, and as we got in the community uh, and working with frontline communities, we were seeing that they were already uh, producing uh, many of the. Um, solutions already. Uh, they were fighting as if their life depended on it, and, and, and it did. And so we started to transition towards um, taking this 100% renewable energy message and moving it to equity, which meant that this wouldn't just be for rich people, or this wouldn't just be for a certain kind of person. Uh, we realized that this was something that was affecting both race and class. And uh, sorry, my cat just showed up. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's kind of how it came to be. And, um, and we've been moving along those equity lines ever since then. And, and that's how I want to throw out the Gloria, but that's how Gloria came to be with us. Um, by practicing our core values and sharing power with people from these frontline communities, which Gloria is. Right. Yeah, Gloria, I know you've been a community organizer and a leader in this space for a long time, and uh, you've worked with Solutions Project, and now you're set to lead it. What are you most excited to get done first? What's like top of your list right now? Uh, most excited. Um, really joining forces with communities that have been doing this work for generations. Um, you know, when I think about my own story and how I connect to the Solutions Project, I was actually an inaugural grantee. I formerly ran an organization called SCOPE, Strategic Concepts in Organizing and Policy Education. And I started as an intern there and was at the organization for 16 years, ran it for 10 of the 16 years. And for us, we realize and just know that it's our communities that live at the intersections of all the issues and we actually saw climate as an intersectional issue. And, you know, when we think about justice and racial justice in particular, it's one of those things that can't be an add on when it comes to climate, but it's an essential element. And that's something that our communities always brought to this conversation. And when we were in spaces with Solutions Project, it's like, you know, we'd go to different events and Solutions Project would be there. I was kind of joking with Mark that, you know, they started, you know, with business, science and culture, but really he was always where community was, was at. And it's like, you can't really do climate work without being where the community is. Um, and so it was a natural fit. And we were honored to be an inaugural grantee of Solutions Project. And eventually um, I was asked to join the board and now coming in as an incoming CEO, I'm, I'm here now. So it just like feels good. I'm 
new but ready um, and joining forces in a different way because doing the work on the ground is where change happens. Um, that's what I know intimately. Um, that's where I come from. And now we're able to move resources to frontline communities, um, both financially, but also thinking about the power and strategy of media and amplifying our voices and our stories and making sure that it's not just my face that's seen or Mark's face, but that we're actually elevating the faces of the leaders on the ground doing the work. Right. And so that's what excites me most about Solutions Project is flashing a light where the light belongs. Um, and that's communities that are on the front lines. Yeah. You mentioned that intersectionality of the fight for environmental justice and racial justice. And then that's something that's been coming up a lot, of course, this summer. Um, can you break that down a little bit more for me, what it means to be part of the climate, the fight for a better climate um, and why that's critical in just for justice in this country? Absolutely. Um, for me, climate justice is the solution of the time, right? It's, it's the epic battle that we are in. Um, it's one of those spaces that's intrinsically intersectional because it's both centering people and the planet in this conversation. And it's recognizing that the models that we've been in practice with are basically outdated, right? Like an extractive economy is outdated, an oppressive economy uh, is outdated, an economy that exploits is outdated. A racist economy <laughs> is been outdated, right? And so climate is actually calling for us to recognize all of those things and seeing that reform today is not enough. People are in the streets calling for transformation. I'm here today calling for transformation. I'm joining forces with communities across the country calling for transformation. And when we see climate, climate justice is the justice piece is making sure that it's malleable and nimble and inclusive, right? Um, it's an economy that is about all of us on this call and my families and our families and the whole society. Uh, climate gives us an opportunity to think about jobs. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to think about energy, water infrastructure, food justice. Um, and, and all of that is what climate justice can hold. It can be hard to conceptualize of some of these things and figure out, you know, what can each of us start doing or be a part of right now. Um, and so many of the climate solutions will take a lot of time to implement. So what do you think is like the number one thing that you would like people to start doing? Well, just, I, I think educating yourself is a, is a big part of it. Um, and there's, there's a lot that you can do to educate yourself uh, right now uh, on these issues. Um, you can you can join uh, the you know the solutions project. You can you can be part of the work we're doing. Um, the other thing is is you know sharing power and and elevating um, those voices um, in those communities, uh, listening to them, um, inviting them into these spaces. I mean I I hate to say it, but the environmental movement is mostly white and um, and the power in the environmental movement is mostly held by white people and leadership. We're seeing a shift in that. And I think that's really important because the more we center on those uh, who have been living with this and, and already uh, developing the solutions, um, I think the quicker we'll move along. And then the other thing is just, um, there is a, an, a dimension of this as, as how you live your own life. But there's also a dimension to holding uh, those powers that be uh, accountable. I'm talking about corporations. I'm talking about the biggest polluters. Um, there's a lot that needs to be done uh, to focus on them, to point the finger at them and to insist that they change their practices. There's only so much any one of us can do on the ground level. The fact of the matter is there are a handful of, of corporate uh, or industries that are responsible for most of this. And it's time that they start to change their practices and that we hold them accountable for it. It's one of those things, like, I think it's absolutely right that 
the power has not been in communities that are on the front lines, uh, communities that are the first to die when it comes to environmental degradation and often um, the ones who have the hardest time recovering. And that's poor communities, that's black, that's um, indigenous, that's communities of color, immigrant communities. Um, you know, when I think about my own family, the reality is that it has been our communities that have been in the EJ movement for generations, but it's a story that hasn't been told. Um, it, the reality is that the dollars haven't been going to where there's the most need. And that's part of what we're trying to change. You know, I think about my grandmother and my mom um, when I was growing up, it's like we were conservationists out of necessity and maybe we didn't have the nomenclature to talk about climate justice or environmentalism um, but my mom was the first to be like, you know, turn the water off. Don't just waste water when you're brushing your teeth, you know, make sure the laundry's full before you start washing your clothes, right? Make sure you turn off the lights if you're not in a room. And so these were practices that I grew up with. Um, I grew up with seeing my grandmother carpooling with my neighbors because it was just a better thing to do. It, it built a sense of community, interdependence, mutuality. And these are all values that we feel like are needed for a regenerative economy. And again, recognizing that reform won't get us there. But the reason that we have folks in the street around racial justice right now, uh, we have leaders like myself and many across the country um, fighting around climate, uh, people of color really approaching the system from many different angles because we see that all of it really has to change. There is a corporate agenda that's at play that's completely unregulated. And our communities are saying regulation needs to happen because we're all accountable, right? We need all hands on deck when it comes to climate. And then you think about power. And I think at the end of the day, all of this is about power. So the organizations that I come from and the organizations that we fund at Solutions Project are all focused on community organizing and power building in local communities. And the overlay, like when I think about what do I want people to think of right now, it's voting, right? It's like people aren't just talking to their neighbors and building community power on the front lines. The overlay is saying we also need to make sure we're exercising our vote. We also need to make sure that our vision and our values are translated at the ballot box. Um, so that would be the one thing I would just infuse into all that rich stuff that you came up with, Mark. Like you just get me excited. <laughs> <laughs> we riff all the time. So that's what we're like great at is just getting together and like brainstorming. Braiding. Exactly. Well, what's really intrigued me in getting to know more about the Solutions Project is that focus on, on grassroots activism, of course, and especially the focus on supporting BIPOC and women in leadership positions. Um, and as you mentioned, Gloria, you were a grantee yourself. Mark, you've penned op-eds about feminine leadership and um, the importance of having women in power. What do you think women are bringing to the table right now that's new or different in 2020? I mean, it's the same thing they've, they've always brought, you know, whether we're talking about the equal rights uh, movement or um, suffragette or, or the civil rights movement, it's, it's, it's a, it's a very community based um, leadership. Um, and, and I mean, they're the they're the holders of life, you know. They 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 are the ones at the end of the day who have to keep the their babies alive. I mean, they're the ones that have that direct connection. Now, I, I don't mean to make a, a, a mass generalization like that, but there's an understanding there that um, that I don't know that all men uh, have um, about these things, about community, but also just in their leadership style. They they are more inclusive. They're less ego driven. They're they're and this this is just from my experience. I mean, we we banned fracking here, and it was led by women. And I was just a soldier um, in in a warrior in that, but I was being sent in the battle by women generals. And what I noticed about them was when they got the call from the governor to say, hey, let's make a deal. They were like, nope, we're banning fracking and that's it. 
And all the guys were scrambling to get close to power, to sit next to it, to feel it. And they stuck with the message. They stuck with the ideology. And, and, and that's what I've noticed again and again and again. It's a kind of commitment that is unshakable, that has nothing to do with personality, has nothing to do with self-aggrandizement uh, or ego. It's all about taking care of the community. Um, and then... Um, and then just having some balance, you know, when you look at Congress, it's all, you know, it's mostly just old white dudes. And how can you have balance? I mean, we need balance. Balance is, I mean, balance is balance. Balance is what, what shows us what we don't normally see. Especially right now when we're seeing how things have broken down and we have a chance to rebuild. I'm curious if you see Solutions Project playing a new type of role or the people that are involved in the projects that you support playing a new type of role in the recovery process as we go forward. Absolutely. Um, the organizations that we invest in, again, are led by Black, Indigenous, immigrant, people of color, women of color, right? This that's who's doing the work on the grounds. Um, and we were doing it yesterday. <laughs> People are doing it today. And our groups and communities will be doing it tomorrow. Um, I think all too often, we're so used to dominant theories of change where uh, we have like one person in elected office that's on the inside, you know, and they're gonna figure it all out for us. But what we're seeing today is that people are actually waking up to the power of, um, what it means to be in community, uh, what community-based power looks like, um, that community-based power can deliver, and that it's actually uh, imperative, right? Like it's not enough to have one person on the inside um, of an institution that is being pulled to the right towards corporate interests, as Mark brought up earlier, um, towards financial interests versus um, you know, interests of the community, right? Like if you're on the inside and you're pulled towards the right, you're really going to be fighting for what's possible within the inside of your institution versus what's needed with local communities. So all of us on the outside are now understanding that the only way for it to be effective is to have both inside outside strategy and holding folks on the inside accountable to our interests because the power is here. You know, everyone that we put in office is supposed to represent our values. And when they're not, you know, it's on us to, to make sure exactly <laughs> that that story changes. <laughs> and we have representation that does. On that note, thank you so much, Mark and Gloria, for taking the time to talk with us. Um, Learned so much from you today. Oh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you so much for having us.